Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming today. My name is Gracie Gregory. I am the Director of Communications and Marketing at the Rust Foundation. I do not typically wear an eye patch. I gave myself a paper cut next to my eye this morning, which is an incredibly analog injury. So the irony of that is not lost on me at this conference. <laughs> nice to meet you all. Thank you for coming. Hi, hi everyone. Again, thank you all for, for coming. Um, I'm Rebecca Rumble. Uh, I am the executive director and CEO of the Rust Foundation. Um, and yeah, really excited to talk to you all today about developing strategy. I think I need glasses for this now. <laughs> Um, so just to give you a little bit of background, um, the Rust Foundation is a pretty young foundation. Um, we have been constituted for about two years, but in terms of like actual operations, we've probably only had about 18 months. So we've had to get going pretty quickly. We've had to kind of figure out a lot of our priorities and, you know, Rust is really hot right now, if you don't know. Um, so yeah, we, we've really had to kind of get going really, really quickly, try and figure out an awful lot of stuff at the same time as kind of hiring people, figuring out our funding situation and what our priorities are. So this has been a bit of a baptism of fire for like the whole staff team trying to figure out a strategy instead of just kind of treading water and firefighting every five minutes. So hopefully we've got some useful uh, lessons uh, that we can share with you today. Um, so just as a quick background, um, open source foundations are kind of, uh, at the same time, much of a muchness, but all unique in their own little ways. Um, in open source, we have a tendency to like to make things from scratch rather than uh, just use the wheel that's already been invented. So our, our governance is slightly different from other open source uh, foundations, but still, you know, the main principles of community and um, corporates and trying to get everyone together on, on consensus. So we're independent. Um, we are funded by our members. Uh, we're funded by philanthropic bodies and other grant making bodies. Um, and yeah, we're here to steward the language. So we're not here to dictate. We're here to make sure that um, the legal assets, the, the trademarks, for instance, are stewarded right. We're here to make sure that the project and the maintainers that support that and develop the language are well supported and well funded and that gaps in the ecosystem are plugged and that the infrastructure on, on, upon which everything is built um, is well funded as well. Um, and so, yeah, our mission is, you know, to make sure that the Rust language is safe, secure, sustainable, um, and that computer systems around the world are more secure through using it. So yeah, now that we've sort of laid that out a bit, um, sort of want to talk about where the Rust Foundation sits within the Rust ecosystem. So obviously this is an important consideration for us as the Rust Foundation, but why should it matter to those of you who are here today? Possibly, hopefully you're interested in Rust and the Rust Foundation, but also, you know, you, you're probably here for takeaways for your own organizations, your own spaces, your own projects. So I think we really see this understanding as really important context as you're sort of navigating the, the many opinions that you're probably faced with, uh, the many perspectives that you're faced with in your own spaces. So understanding this breakdown of exactly where we sit in our own ecosystem really helped us see exactly how much we, we need a strategy. Um, so sort of going into the breakdown, obviously we have the REST project. So this is the hardworking group of, of maintainers and leaders building and maintaining the REST language. Uh, closely related, we have the community, which is composed of contributors, users, you know, that, that means both organizations using the language and also individuals uh, using and supporting REST. And then of course, you have us, the Rust Foundation. We are an independent nonprofit serving as essentially the custodian of the language. We really provide support structures and services that allow Rust to thrive. And again, going through all of this as a preliminary exercise of just really mapping out where we sit is, is, was really essential in shaping our strategy, which we'll talk to you about today. Yeah, again, real basics, and I'm assuming none of this will be a big surprise to anyone, um, 501c6. 
there was always a, a conversation about whether we wanted to be a 501c3 um, or a 501c6. 501c3 is it's completely charitably focused. Um, there's a lot more paperwork with a 501c3. Uh, 501c6 is a trade association, um, so it's not quite as heavy on the bureaucracy, um, and it still allows us to act as a nonprofit <coughs> um, and to serve our members. We're essentially a kind of trade association. Um, as I said, we're funded by our member organizations, amongst other things. We also get a lot of in-kind um, things given to us, <coughs> run by a small team um, of foundation staff. There are 10 of us, so we're not huge. Um, and we're governed by a board of directors. We have member directors. These are the people, <coughs> excuse me. These are the people that are placed on the board by our platinum members. Uh, we also have project directors, so a core group of maintainers from the project um, who were voted in by the project and they have equal uh, decision-making, <coughs> they have equal decision-making capacity on the board. We also have a system of supermajority on the board so that the voices of the project don't get squeezed out by corporate interests. Sorry, we strive to do our work in the open as well. So we, we try and do as much consensus-based work as possible and we try to be as transparent as possible about what we're doing. Um, yeah, so so what we do is we'll sort of walk you through the primary areas where, where we focus, which we've already started to do, but so really first up, we provide the infrastructure that's critical to the Rust ecosystem, and we also help maintain and improve it. We provide resources and guidance to advance Rust security as well, related to the first point, uh, infrastructure and security. Um, we really tackle the behind the scenes legal and administrative work that would otherwise bog down the project and community and really distract from their essential focus of building and maintaining a valuable language. We also uh, advocate for and support the REST language through things like event sponsorships, grants, funding, and we also forge industry partnerships, outreach efforts, standardization and adoption efforts, um, all of which make it easier for organizations and for people to learn and to implement rest and i think i might have been behind a bullet so sorry about that vision issues today <laughs> so let's sort of talk about the broader perspective of these activities not again not simply to stand up here as the rest foundation to talk about ourselves but really to help you understand how our strategy came together and some of the takeaways for you having a clear understanding of all of this will really allow you to build better relationships within your ecosystems and to anticipate strategic risks. So our perennial goal with infrastructure and security within the Rust ecosystem is to really help maintain and advance the progression of Rust because we see it as a very critical programming language as it seems an increasing number of organizations, people, communities do. Our legal and administrative goals are really centered around supporting Rust to ensure its long it's long-term success. So that includes things like legal compliance, very, very important, fundraising, managing and allocating the funds that we, that we raise, managing a staff to support all of our activities, complying with legal regulations, et cetera. Um, we, really, we really try to run an organization that's well-managed, that's effective, and again, compliant, while taking that back, that background grunt work off of the plates of the project and community. Our community advocacy work serves really to nurture and support both the existing and the future base of Rust talent. And we really try to do this through education and training efforts, which we're definitely working on more in our next phase, which we'll talk about, and also broader community support initiatives and special funding programs. We are also very actively focused on advocating for, for Rust in relevant industry forms, much like this one, through storytelling about Rust um, and by developing resources that really outline the benefits of Rust through really important industry partnerships with other organizations and companies that are aligned with the mission of Rust. I really see driving adoption in the enterprise 
in the public sector across the global community as one of our most essential roles. The REST Foundation wants to make it as strategic as possible for as many people, groups, companies, government, organizations, agencies as possible to adopt REST and to reap its benefits, which include, as some of you might know, memory safety, performance, reliability. Um, it's quote unquote as simple as that. <laughs> It's never that simple, though. Um, so yeah, those are kind of you know th those are kind of the headings we grouped roughly what we do, what we thought we should do, what we have been kind of plowing along, uh, doing th thus far. That's how we've kind of think. Okay, these are roughly things. But just because this is kind of what we do, it doesn't necessarily mean that this is a strategic approach to stewarding language, making sure that we are sustainable, uh, making sure that we're delivering for the future. Um, but we do kind of think these are all roughly things we do need to continue doing. Um, and they all cost money. Um, any, any kind of like strategic effort, any kind of planning that, that we're doing, we want to be strategic, but we need to also be strategic with how we're raising our funds and how we're spending them. Um, and not just actual cash dollars, but all of that in-kind support that we rely on as a foundation to, to provide the, the um, the foundations for for us to be built and to grow so these are it's, it's really really important as part of the strategy not just to think okay we want to do this or we need to do this um it's like okay what are the financial and resource constraints that that are going to shape how we approach this in the future so these are kind of the strategic considerations that we were asking ourselves when we were developing the strategy, you know, as I said, finances, that's a really, really big consideration. How is that, how is the, the kind of external big world financial and resource landscape going to exert pressure on what we are able to do, what we're able to afford to do, um, and how we can kind of plan to sustain, maintain, or grow in the future. Um, and, you know, I have anyone here probably that runs a project or an organization knows that you probably have a really long list of stuff you'd love to do that you'd be really excited to, to roll your sleeves up and get stuck into. Um, but there's only so many hours in the day. There's only so many people that you can enlist. Um, you know, there are a lot of resource constraints. So like those are big world stuff. Like at the moment, you know, the kind of mini tech recession and a lot of redundancies. The, the cash restriction has implications. I'm not sure we could have foreseen that two years ago. Maybe some people could, I don't know. Um, but yeah, we have to kind of build this into our kind of strategic planning so that we're not just kind of, oh yeah, growth's gonna be exponential and it's gonna be fine. Um, we also really need to know who our stakeholders are. You know, not just, okay, the project maintainers. Yes, they are probably the most important people. Uh, without them, there's no rust. Um, but there are a bunch of other people as well that are, you know, deeply involved and, and deeply concerned um, and invested in the language, in the foundation, and in where it's going from here. Um, we need to kind of build their needs and their expectations um, and, you know, their requirements if they're governments, you know, their regulations. We need to, to think about all of these things too. Um, and we want to be, we want to be cognizant of where we want to be in the future as well. You know, it's easy to say, well, you know, we're just here to steward, but to what end? You know, are we here to kind of keep the status quo? That's easier said than done. Um, even if, and, and even if we want to just keep the status quo, that's actually requires some strategic foresight, right? Um, instead, you know, to avoid being kind of sent off on a tangent or down a rabbit hole. Um, so really, you know, when we're kind of talking and developing this strategy, trying to figure out, okay, what is what is our vision? What does our mission look like in three, five, ten years time? Because the world's going to be a very different place. So market forces, I think the policy focus um, has changed so, so massively over the last couple of years. Security in particular. Um, I don't know how many of you have been coming to, to this conference or similar ones for, for a few years, but like four or five years ago, 
supply chain security was barely a thing. It was a kind of little bolt on one session um, right at the end of the conference. Um, it's now one of the biggest things that, that people are concerned about and talking about. And governments have, have woken up to this and they now want to speak to us and they now want to look at regulations and other kind of structural mechanisms to ensure uh, consumer protection. Um, there's, there's growing commitment from enterprises as well. Um, there's lots and lots of leadership um, decision making at the moment that it has an interest in open source and how we are conducting ourselves. Um, and there's just a lot of a lot of new need. You know, there's a lot of tech out there, and there's a lot of people that are interested in. You know, for us, you know, as the Rust Foundation, Rust is something that people are super interested in. Um, and there's a lot of potential experimentation um, and a lot of stuff that um, you know we we simply we know that there's some cool, exciting stuff possibly coming down the road, but we're not quite sure what it is yet. Okay, um, so. <laughs> Um, again, we kind of talked a little bit earlier about, okay, well, these are the things we do. Um, I think what we, what we needed to do when we were trying to figure out our strategy and when we were talking to our stakeholders is try and find a difference between, okay, what's absolutely mission critical? Like, what if we stopped funding X or we stopped doing Y, would that mean that there was no point in us existing? You know, if we had to scale everything back, if we have to go completely back to basics, um, if we were going back to just being volunteers um, and not having any paid staff, what are the things we would still have to make sure existed for Rust to be a thing? Um, so we, we had to kind of identify, okay, yeah, like infrastructure, for instance. If we can't support crates, there's no Rust. So, you know, that's kind of got to go right at the top of this is absolute, absolutely critical, just maintaining it. But, you know, how can we improve it if that's one of our mission critical things? Um, again, lots of these things, like from the top, these are kind of our most important things. These are the things that will make us sustainable. It will, it will maintain a certain level of quality. And like coming down these, again, to that kind of wish list I was talking about, like things like much more advocacy. I mean, advocacy, it's like how long's a piece of string? You can do a bit of advocacy, you can do a buttload of advocacy. Um, but these are things that we can we can make bigger or smaller depending on what kind of resources we have available. Um, but yeah, these are kind of like, okay, identify your mission critical and then identify what is nice to have, what will support the mission critical stuff to be better or higher quality um, and go from there. So our stakeholders, in other words, who has a voice in the conversation of Rust's use, its growth, its adoption, its success? Whose perspectives are we considering on an ongoing basis? Um, I won't read through this whole list because it's right there, but um, I do just want to say at the top that it's really important to consider this when you're doing the work of building a long-term strategy because Again, it allows you to better understand your ecosystem's needs and its priorities, and having this clear understanding really allows you to build better relationships and anticipate strategic risks. So this breakdown is, is really related to that slide that I shared earlier about you know the, the differences and similarities between the Rust Project, the community, the foundation. All parties listed here are our stakeholders in regards to the general work we do on this ongoing basis. But in terms of the stakeholders uh, that we that we worked with in the process of really drafting our three to five year strategy, we developed it first within our team, within the Rust Foundation team, um, and then we involved our board of directors, the Rust project directors that also serve as our board members, um, as part of our board members and leaders within the Rust project. It was important to us to sort of sketch out our general plan that I'll, I'll walk through in a minute um, within the foundation team and sort of share it for comment within the groups I just mentioned um, sort of first before sharing it publicly, mainly because although of course we strive for transparency and we do our work in the open, um, we, we wanted to involve a small group uh, because it really allowed us to gather action-oriented feedback and make adjustments to our plan in a really short time frame, which when you have many perspectives, requests, um, opinions, um, 
being shared with you as a foundation, as an organization, it's important to sort of set up that strategy in an expedient way and put it in place so you can act upon it. So we really wanted to have this whole process be very action oriented and we, we plan to sort of share the strategy more widely very soon. Um, so I always end up talking about the funding landscape. Like my only job is just to go around and ask people for money. Um, <laughs> anyone that manages the project here knows this, right? Um, so I mean, currently, you know, as we as we kind of spun up the the foundation, you know, we had a mix of membership fees. That was really like the primary uh, source of funding for us. But we've also had like a few grants, um, and we in turn, you know, we give sort of grants and fellowships to. Um, like budding maintainers, um, we support um, the project through employing directly employing engineers for kind of critical parts um, of the project and the infrastructure, and you know have in kind resources. Um, one of the biggest problems for any any organization, foundation, whatever project um, is like protecting that core funding. Um, core funding is always a risk. Um, you know, you can be fantastically well-funded one year, and then all of a sudden, oh, it's 2023, there's a mini tech recession, and actually the funders that you have relied on for years are all of a sudden thinking, oh, the optics aren't great for us throwing money at you while we're making redundancies. Um, so funding is always a little bit of a risk, and it's something that it's really, really difficult um, to secure for like more than like a yearly basis. Very few of our supporters will say, we'll give you three years funding. Um, which would give us so much more <laughs> security and ability to, to plan strategically. Um, you're always kind of thinking, oh, it's only a year. So even down to things like recruiting, you know, it's really difficult to recruit really good people um, when you can, when you have to honestly say to them, look, I want to keep you for more than a year, but I can't guarantee it because my funding only gets renewed on an annual basis. Um, so it's it's a risk, and it, and it's something that is kind of to the detriment of long-term strategy planning. Um, again, all of these, you know, big world funding issues are a problem. Um, we're also, you know, for the Rust Foundation, it's super that so many people are interested and excited about Rust and experimenting. You know, governments are kind of going around saying, yeah, memory safety, use a memory safety language. Yes, Rust. Um, that still costs us money. <laughs> you know, oh, it's this perennial thing that open source is free, but it's not really free. We're still kind of having to, to pay for all of that infrastructure and maintain and manage it. Um, so whilst it's great that people want to use it and we want to be there for you, we you know have to figure into our planning that we have to pay for all of this growth. Um, and yeah, there's 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 very there's myriad things, but yeah, funding kind of colors everything that we're thinking about in terms of strategy and when we're talking to our stakeholders um you know that there is a balance between even our partners who are very generous and who you know give us money are saying well we really want you to do x but we can't give you the money for it until next year okay well come talk to me next year then <laughs> um and in terms of that kind of, you know, the, the further away you get in terms of looking into the future, your crystal ball and where we want to be, um, the harder it gets to be really detailed. Um, I think with a strategic plan, the best thing is to not really be too detailed, you know, have a vision of, of how you want the world to see you. When we were doing this, it was, it was really difficult when we were talking to our partners and our stakeholders, they would give us a shopping list. They'd be like, I want this, I want a specification, and I want more people on this particular team, and I was like, it's like, great, yes, we can build that into a strategy, but that's not the strategy, because that's not the, this is where we want to be in X number of years. What we want is, we want the language to be really high quality and supported um, by X, Y, Z kind of regulation or specification or whatever. Um, we want it to be recognized by these agencies, NIST, for instance. And, you know, that means that certain conditions have to be meant to be there. So we try and kind of get a bigger picture of how we want the world to see who we are in this point, what we want the world to think of the Rust language. You know, is it delivering on all the promises that we're making about it right now? Um, and how is the world approaching the language and the foundation in terms of that narrative? 
So now that we've sort of walked through those five questions that we asked ourselves when we set out to build this strategy, um, you know, you sort of have an idea of where we started when we, we began fleshing it out. Um, this foundational work that we did, no pun intended, uh, really allowed us to more clearly see where our focus needed to be directed in the short, medium, and, and the longer term. Um, and where we landed was really on five pillars of strategic action that that guide our financial and resource investment decisions. And so those are as follows. Um, as you can guess, because we've talked about it so far a lot, um, infrastructure and ecosystem management, community development, my personal favorite and area of expertise, storytelling, member investment, and expert stewardship. So as I've, as I've mentioned earlier, we have not yet published our three to five year strategy. So today is a bit of a worldwide exclusive maybe, <laughs> um, but we, we will be doing that soon. Um, and so today I'll really give you a, a brief tour of, of where we landed um, thanks to this focused planning and those considerations that we laid out and that we did in collaboration with the stakeholders that we mentioned. So I'll sort of take it pillar by pillar and, and don't strain to read this because there's a lot of information there. And again, uh, we, will be, we will be sharing this very soon. Um, so our first pillar, um, e infrastructure and ecosystem management. So our vision here is really for the infrastructure supporting REST to be well-managed, to be financially sustainable, to be scalable, and to be coherent. Um, the work associated with this is includes things like our security initiative, which is an effort that we launched last year with, with very generous support from Alpha Omega, um, from OpenSSF, and from JFrog, who also, who also donated in-kind support. So thank you to both of them. Um, another, another piece of associated work is, is developing strong cloud infrastructure and fundraising for very critical infrastructure, infrastructure services to the REST project um, that are reliable and again, scalable. So onto the next pillar, community development. Our goal here for the next three to five years is for the global REST community to be, to be diverse, inclusive, and really composed of a well-supported staff, well-supported contributors, maintainers, and stakeholders. And some of the breakdown of how we hope to achieve this is through targeted support and development programs. So that includes things like our community grants program and our fellowships, which are part of that. Um, education and training programs and, and work and support for moderators within the REST project and similar things like that. For the storytelling pillar, our primary goal here is for the REST language and its many, many benefits to be well known and well understood, which is very important. Um, this needs to be not only within the global software community, but also by regulators, by, by governments worldwide, by regulatory bodies. And also for the REST Foundation to be recognized as a recognizable <laughs> steward for this work. And the way we plan to fulfill this is through very focused marketing and communications work, including the development of a robust thought leadership program, as well as a, as a rust evangelism strategy. And all of this is very dependent on strong strategic channels of communication um, with regular activity. On to member investment. Our goal is for corporate members of the rust foundation to be engaged and very active in the work of the foundation, and also for the foundation to play an active role in identifying and also addressing key development opportunities within this ecosystem. We want to ensure that we're also providing them with, with really high, valuable, high value resources so they can do this work and really show up uh, to the full ability of their role. Um, I would also just like to do a shameless plug here. Uh, if, you, if your organization is interested in, in membership at the REST Foundation, please come up and see us. I might not be able to see you, but, <laughs> but we would love to talk to you. Uh, <laughs> um, and finally, expert stewardship. Our vision is really to demonstrate holistic 
up and down excellence in management and in administration as a nonprofit to be considered influential and effective and of course professional. This can really only happen if our policies and our processes continue to evolve as we scale, which we continue to do and we intend to keep doing. Um, we also, this is very important, have to meet our, our regulatory and our legal obligations. That's ongoing work. It requires a lot of attention. Again, this is an area that we ideally, we're taking this work off of the REST community and the REST project. Our staff needs to be and feel well supported. Our budget needs to be stable and well-funded. And our team and our board need to feel really empowered to act as vocal advocates for REST and for the foundation as well. Easy peasy, right? Like, oops, so <laughs> um, yeah, so as you can see, we were quite ambitious, like the, the way we ended up structuring those pillars, it was roughly similar to how we started out at the beginning of the process, like trying to roughly group some of our kind of work. But the difference is that when we started out, it was like, right, okay, what are we doing? Right, okay, we're doing a bit of this, we're doing a bit of that. We're definitely doing that because that's really important. We mustn't forget that. Um, but there was a lot of stuff kind of underpinning it that, that we weren't really thinking about. It's like, we have to do this, not we have to do this and we have to do this well and we have to do this in a way that means we're not burning out people in the community or in the staff team or we're not just relying on one source of income or one source of resources which means it's like high risk for, for uh, sustainability, right? So even though we kind of almost feel like we've come full circle, um, having this process means that we have thought about it in a far more kind of strategic, sensible, rational way that will enable us to be sustainable. Um, the other really important thing about having this strategy, and like, is, like Gracie said, you know, it's not quite there yet, but it will be soon. Having this in the public domain enables us to be really transparent with everyone about where we're going and why we're making certain decisions because we're always going to have to make trade-offs as to what we prioritize or what we pursue versus what we don't pursue. You know, and sometimes we'll make a decision which might be, okay, well, they've offered us X amount of funding. Why aren't we biting their hands off? But it means that it's actually not serving us to get where we've decided that where consensus has said we want to be. Um, this document and this document enables us to actually look at opportunities and say, okay, that sounds exciting, and it might have been something that you know, like a dog chasing cars, I would have run off at like a year ago. But actually, having this enables me to sit down and say, okay, how does this serve us? How does this serve the foundation? How does this serve the language? Does it get us to where we want to go? And you know, I'm not saying we've thought of everything. You know, there could be something <laughs> that is completely unexpected that falls out of the sky, and it's like, okay, well, it wasn't in the strategy, but it's very, very clearly part of achieving this vision. So you know, that will be fine. But this enables us to kind of legitimize our decision making. Um, if if people from outside say, why haven't you done X or actually this thing looks really hot right now we want you to, to spend time on it we can bring this out and we can sort of say well this is kind of what was agreed you know like can you explain to me how you think this fits it enables more structured conversations about how we direct and how we prioritize our resources which is really really useful because again as gracie said when you're talking to so many stakeholders and there's so many opinions it, it's difficult to try and like cut, like get a message that cuts through and is like resonates with people. So we're hoping that this helps in our communications in future. Um, and it helps us think about scaling. It's like, okay, we've decided this. These are the things that are like, these are the activities that we think are gonna get us there. Um, but again, we're not like getting down into the weeds. I, I don't know how many of you, probably quite a few of you here. I've been in so many organizations that have written a strategy and it's been like, 72 pages long, and there's bullets for absolutely every activity apparently every employee is going to do for the next five years. And within like three weeks, it's out of date because something, something's changed or they haven't thought about like big world stuff. Um, so we're, we're not aiming to get that granular. You know, this is all about these rough things, these overarching things that are going to get us to where we need to be. 
um, and it enables us to kind of have a clear narrative. It enables us to talk to members, to the community on all sides. These are just things hopefully that people understand are invested in. Yeah, I think that that's, I think it's a really good point to, that Beck made that, you know, although this is a very structured, organized strategy that we've come up with, it doesn't mean that it is rigid. It actually allows us more flexibility to, con to consider things that are brought to us. And it really allows us to be more organized in how we sort of field all of those things. And I think what I've learned is it's, it's through this process is it's made it's made it a lot easier for me to just make sense of everything that's sort of coming at us as a request and all the different areas of need within within the ecosystem. So on to the good stuff, takeaways for all of you here today. Um, from that very brief tour of, of this strategy, I hope you can sort of see where those five questions, those five considerations we laid out earlier sort of fit in and how they helped frame the pillars that we landed on. Um, you probably also noticed in, in that rundown that we really broke out, although we have obviously this, this larger mission of the foundation, which we ran through in the beginning, there, there, there are specific visions underneath each of these pillars that sort of support that mission. Um, and then underneath that, there, there are specific actionable things that we need to accomplish. That's sort of, that's sort of how those questions inform the strategy, and that's the structure that it took. Um, so some, some lessons learned and some takeaways for all of you. Prioritization. It's really key to prioritize actionable goals. That might sound simple, but it is, as we have spoken to a little bit, it is actually, it can be quite difficult. Um, as, as many of you know, when you work for an open source community, you're going to receive constant feedback about where to focus, uh, differing opinions about about what a priority is, what that even means. Um, and the truth is everything cannot be a first priority even if it feels like a first priority. Um, this is why a strategy is necessary and it's also what makes this work difficult and interesting and challenging. Um, but really there, there is no path towards making an impact as an organization like ours without prioritizing actionable goals and sort of staying firm on them. Again, flexible, but firm. <laughs> um, success is not instantaneous. Chances are that if you are here, you are driven like we are to have a positive, a positive impact in your specific arena. If this is true, um, you probably also know that, that it's important to sort of set and adhere to ambitious goals. Um, these goals take time to yield real results that are even worth presenting and talking about publicly. <laughs> um, there is going to either occasionally or very often be an expectation for, for instant results uh, because we're working in the open source community. We're working with the open source community and this is a passionate group of people. If, if your organization is structured like ours, there's also, there's also money that's being factored in from organizations that also care about your mission. And because of that, again, there's an expectation for quick results. And while all of that is understandable, it's to be expected, it, it's just not realistic. Um, so I think with all of that said, although you can't guarantee instant results, having a strategy really allows you to build high quality and very real momentum, which will sort of drive your organization towards the results that you're after. Long-term sustainability is non-negotiable. Um, this again factors into that kind of prioritization um, point. Um, there are there are numerous opportunities sometimes to like grab onto something that's exciting or new or interesting. Um, equally, you know, you might have a groundswell of enthusiasm for one particular thing that's really interesting right now, or that everyone's diverting their attention towards. Um, and there might be really, really loud voices saying, you need to focus on this, um, or you really need to put money in this right now because this is what we're interested in. Um, and it can be really hard sometimes to, to take a step back from that and, you know, kind of going back to what I was saying earlier, you know, ask the question instead of just like going with it because this is the popular thing right now. Take a step back and say, 
does this actually get me to where I need to go? Is this going to serve the goals that, that we have agreed? Um, and if the answer is no, you know, or if the answer is even worse, actually doing this short-term thing that everyone wants um, might actually destabilize or risk our future as a foundation and, and as a steward of the language. Um, you know, unfortunately, sometimes we have to make decisions that are unpopular in in the you know pursuit of sustainability and you know financial prudence. These are super boring things to most people. Um, but you know we have to sometimes be the boring people in the room that say mm, budget says no, um, or actually if we if we take a punt on this or if we go off in this direction, there's probably no way back. Um, and you know people a lot of the time simply are not thinking in the kind of long term way that you need to think if you are sustaining an organization or you're trying to achieve something strategically, if, as Gracie said, <laughs> a little bit slower than people would like. Um, so yeah, it, it's really important to be able to, to say no, um, to explain that. And again, having this kind of strategy in the public domain enables us to point to this and say, well, this actually is what agreed. We, we cannot see how it fits. We cannot see how this serves all of the goals um, that, that we've already agreed on. And finally, strategies are strongest when everyone's involved, right? Um, it's easy for us to write a strategy. If it doesn't actually speak to people, then we'll publish it on the website. No one will ever read it. Um, and in two years' time, maybe someone will suggest we write another strategy. <laughs> Um, it's, it's, this is meant to be a living, working document, you know, and it's again why I said earlier, we're not putting loads of detail in it. We're not going to be like, in April 2023, Beck is going to do X. This is not what it's about. It's about kind of driving that ambition that, that we've identified. Um, and part of that is making sure, as Gracie said earlier, our members are super engaged. You know, the people on the board, the people in the communities, the people that are in think tanks and governments and everywhere else. We, we want to co-opt these people. We want these people to come with us on this journey and help us get there because we can't make people interested on our own. We can't change the world on our own. We need to work with other people um, to, to make Rust as amazing as we know it can be. So, yeah, bringing everyone with us is our goal, or as many people as possible. <laughs> and that's it. Right, any last bits? Yes, just shout out to everyone who was involved in in helping us with the strategy, because like we like we outlined, there were many different stakeholders, and I, as Beck just mentioned in that last point, we we could not have gotten here without all of those voices. So yeah, thank you.